Greetings, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Reconsider Simon podcast where I explore reality itself and everything weird and wonderful that's happening around us. And uh, yeah, today's episode, we're going to be looking at time slips, the concept of time slips. And yeah, just before I get into that, just want to make a note that I've recently released a new video, it's like a vlog style video, uh, slightly documentary style uh, concerning a trip that I did to Glastonbury in April of this year, 2024. And it gets into a lot to do with the legends of King Arthur and Jesus and some quite weird and wonderful concepts come from that. And it was actually quite a profound journey for me as well, because it kind of delves into the idea of what it is to be born on this land, whether you define that as Britain or England or Albion. Um, it was just some very profound spiritual messages that I seem to get from the whole King Arthur and the legends of King Arthur. So yeah, please do take a look. That's on YouTube or Rumble or BitChute. So returning back to the main concept of this podcast, which is time slips. And this generally occurs, just it happens to normal people. And they can just be going about their day or night. And then suddenly they're just transported to a completely different time. It could be the Victorian era. There's another example I'm going to be discussing later on where these two ladies find themselves in the Enlightenment period. And there's also a few examples of people seeing the future as well. And it's not like these people then just get stuck in those, those eras. They're not like stuck in time. They do return back to the present. Um, and what I've discovered is actually it's not just one case. It's just a litany of cases, you know, across the ages. So it's quite a regular thing that kind of seems to happen. I came across this concept because generally I was, you know, research. I was looking for paranormal activity or high strangeness in my local area. As many of you, of you all know, if you've been listening for a while, um, you know, I'm temporarily in my sort of hometown of Chester. And I've been occasionally traveling to West Kerber, which is on the sea. It's in the Wirral. And, you know, basically there's a huge marine lake there and I've just been windsurfing. And it's a place also to sort of spend a certain amount of time in my youth as well, going dinghy sailing. So I know that area quite well. And I've been sort of driving back and forth from Chester to West Kirby, you know, literally, you know, once or twice a week, probably about a 40 minute journey. And um, so I've just been generally looking, you know, that whole area, Chester, the Wirral, West Kirby, to sort of see what I can find. And if you don't know what, where I'm talking about in the United Kingdom, if you look at the sort of the top left of England, where kind of the Wales meets, I would guess, England, it's quite close to Manchester, it's quite close to Liverpool. And the Wirral is this kind of block of square land, essentially. On the right hand side, you have the Mersey estuary, which kind of obviously then goes through into Liverpool. And on the left hand side, you have the D estuary, and that's the river then which goes through Chester. So you have this kind of block of land, which is described as the Wirral. I mean, across the world, I think Liverpool's kind of on the map due to the Beatles. Um, and most people would know that accent. What's interesting about the Liverpool accent I've always found is that you kind of refer back to old uh, videos of the Beatles being interviewed. The accent's quite soft in comparison to what you get now. It's like really, really thick, really, really strong. And, and what you find is that, you know, the kind of will, you still have a, a Liverpudian accent, but it's a lot softer. And even going into Chester, people have a kind of slight Liverpudian twinge to that accent. I didn't even really, really recognise it until I actually left, you know, after as a teenager, I kind of left Chester, spent a time away from home and then came back for Christmas. And then I just suddenly realised actually how Liverpudian the accent is. It was quite funny. But I'm always looking around in West Kirby. I always found quite fascinating. It's got a lot of sandstone similar to Chester. And there's strange obelisks here and there. And it's always kind of piqued my interest. I haven't really deep dived into researching that much yet. Um, but overall, I was just generally searching Google for kind of strange and interesting stories. And this is where I stumbled upon this website called the Wirral Globe. Sometimes in the UK, I'm not sure about other places in the world. Um, we obviously have like local news websites, um, but we have a few in the UK where they tend to be sort of satirical, like comedy, and sometimes quite hard, I guess, because the world is so crazy at the moment. It's hard to sort of decipher fact from fiction. Um, but this one is a genuine local news site after a bit of digging. And there's an author on there called Tom Sleeman. And I've never heard of him before, but he does have a series of books. Um, he seems quite prolific in discussing 
you know, the paranormal and high strangeness, particularly around Liverpool. And he's got around about 40 books and they're all titled Haunted Liverpool, but they're just different versions, different volumes, you know, volume one, volume two. And they got, again, he's got about 40 of them. So he's obviously pretty well versed in all the high strangers in that area. And again, this is the first time I've ever come across this individual, but I think he may have featured on a local radio, may have had a regular show or been a guest on a show, local radio to Liverpool. So I think he's, he's no, well known, you know, if you're into high strangers and the paranormal that people, you know, the Liverpool area do know him. But on this Wirral Globe website, again, I'll put some links in the description so you can check for yourself. But there's just article after article you know, discussing time slips and people's stories, you know, that have occurred in West Kirby, a lot of them, um, but also just in the whole Wirral area and Liverpool area as well. And I think what he's doing is maybe getting uh, stories from, you know, locals, people are sending him letters or emails. And it does make, it makes like the Wirral look like the nexus of time, just like this is crazy bending of time anomaly that's occurring in the area. The sheer volume of content is quite impressive for this Wirral Globe website. And, you know, my, back in my mind, I was like, you know, is this really true? Is this really happening so much in this area? And I guess what he's doing is just not, he's just basically receiving content from people and he's just releasing it. And so who knows, you know, how much of this is true or not, you know, because people obviously could make these things up. But these time slip articles were starting to be released in about 2017 and he's still doing it to this day. So there's a lot to you know look through. Like any topic like this, I mean, I've done a certain amount of research and, you know, you dig deep and you uncover sort of hidden gems. Um, and then it comes to kind of recording I'm at a certain position. And then when I release the podcast and I start coming across new information, so I could be missing kind of aspects to the story here, but... It does seem that, you know, this whole idea of time slips is very UK centric. I mean, there are examples definitely of other ones occurring, you know, in the world. Uh, but the United Kingdom, specifically the northwest is it, west of England, and there's a very, you know, very famous street in Liverpool called Bold Street, which is referenced everywhere. There's, you know, there's articles on different re websites across the world, and they always seem to mention Bold Street in Liverpool. So it's quite a famous location for this time slip anomaly. And because of that, you know, on Reddit, it has its own threads. If you go on YouTube, there's countless people talking about this story and, you know, their understanding of it. And there's multiple, you know, different events with different people having the same sort of, you know, experience. So again, it all seems very UK centric. And strangely, I'm always finding uh, connections to do with cultural media at the time. It could be films, could be movies, could be TV series. And again, this, this anomaly has very much a connection to certain TV shows that were produced back in the 1970s, which I'm kind of going to get to as well. Um, so, yeah, so you've got kind of the UK as a whole having all these very strange time slips as countless stories. There is one quite funny story, which I'm going to bring up later on as well, with a guy who falls down some kind of time hole, but it's not really going to a different era, time era. He goes to what's a different dimension in a dimension where the Beatles never broke up and he managed to steal this cassette tape of their material and then brought it back to this reality. And so you can actually listen to this music on YouTube of these like lost Beatles, you know, songs that were discovered from this other dimension. And there's a whole website kind of revolving around this story as well. So I'll leave you to figure out whether you think that's true or not. Um, I think it's probably not true, but it's quite a good fun read anyway. And the music about, you know, that's being recovered, this lost Beatles anthology is actually pretty good music anyway. So time slips, is, it's kind of like ghosts where I think, you know, you're going to find stories which you're like, eh, I'm not sure I believe that. But there are definitely stories out there where you're like, well, that is really, really strange. Just due to the people involved, the information they had, and the fact like all of these kind of situations with like high strangers, the paranormal if in your a certain position of responsibility and you've got a certain social standing and you're talking about stuff like this, it really harms your credentials and then people will kind of look at you weird. So when people like that are sort of talking about these sort of stories and you're like, okay, I'm going to sort of pay attention to this as, as being a potential real thing. But returning back to Tom Sleeman's work, 
Again, he's centered around the Wirral. And the West Kirby is quite a major town in the Wirral area. And it just feel, feels quite funny how some of these stories makes it feel like an Edgar Wright movie. And he's a director, British director, tends to do a lot of comedy films. And you have like a film called Shaun of the Dead, which is, you know, details a zombie apocalypse that happens in a London suburb. So it's very different to the usual sort of zombie films you have where they tend to be in big city locations like in America. And another film he did was like Hot Fuzz, which is a, an American buddy cop style movie. But again, is is based in a, in a suburb. And it's kind of like what West Kirby feels like in a way. You have these like quite grand idea of like time slips of people having these experiences in a completely different timeline, but it's in a very sort of quite quaint, slightly run down sort of seaside town. I call it the Riviera of the North for the waters, definitely not Saint Tropez. It's it's quite muddy because it's estuary water, so yeah, inherently it's a little bit brown looking. So it's no, there's no kind of like beautiful blue seas there at all. And when the tide goes out, it just goes out for miles and you have this vast expanse of sandy beach and there's a series of islands you can actually walk to as well when the tide's out. So on this Wirral Globe website, uh, Tom has an article. It's called Tom Sleeman's Haunted Wirral, More Time Slips on Landican Lane. And this is uh, released in the 2nd of June of this year, 2024. So the article goes on to say that there's a time slip hotspot near Landican Lane. And this was reported um, near to a public footpath where it crosses the M53 via bridge. And there were two painters working, Jimmy and Bob. And this happened back in 1984, this encounter. And what occurred is that their their work van unfortunately broke down on Landican Lane. Now, Jimmy, the painter decorator, decided to explore a nearby field where the van was and he saw something very unusual in the field. He saw this massive unknown craft in the field and it was white, it had windows and panels and it had two glass domes on top of the craft and a sign near to the craft itself where, while it was hovering and it said Heswald Spaceport. In the same field and also near the craft and the other sign, they discovered another sign that actually had a red line emblem on it with the words Republic of Britain written beside the symbol itself. And the painters were both very confused what this craft was. Was it a plane? Um, apparently Jimmy at the time thought it was some kind of top secret military exercise. And while they're having this experience, the craft actually admitted this siren had like flashing lights and the ship slowly started to take off and the whole ground kind of rumbled around them. As the ship was flying away, they also noticed that that same red lion symbol was also seen on the hull of the ship. And as it went into off into the distance, they started to spot a second ship that looked very, very similar coming into view. Um, at this point, Bob, the other painter, decorator, managed to fix the broken van. They were both very, very spooked by the whole situation and decided to leave the area immediately. Jimmy apparently warned Bob not to share this story. They were both terrified of what happened and they didn't want to be ridiculed. Bob decided to sort of tell his family about the strange encounter and they were actually ridiculed for their spaceship story. Later on, they did return to the same site where they had this experience and the whole spaceport sign completely disappeared. There was no signs of these like, you know, advanced craft flying around. There was nothing there, what they witnessed previously. Um, but what did occur apparently shortly after this event that there were multiple UFO sightings reported on the radio, again near the M53, which is very near to where the painter decorator's van originally broke down. Um, and the actual author, Tom Sleeman, he thinks that these weren't actually UFOs, but people were seeing these future spacecraft. Um, and he did a little bit of research in terms of, you know, what's to come in terms of like future spaceports and it turns out that actually there's a spaceport, I never knew this, there's a spaceport that's being built uh, near Snowdonia, which is in Wales. So it's relatively close by, you know, Snowdonia is the largest mountain, I think, in, in Wales, beautiful area. And there's a series of spaceports that are, are planned to be constructed around the United Kingdom. I didn't realise this all happened. It was the UK space flight laws, which were established in 2018. Um, so yeah. Potentially, maybe these gentlemen did see spacecraft from a different era, from a future aspect of humanity where we have access to this sort of flying saucer UFO technology. 
There was another aspect to the same article in 1960. Apparently two boys witnessed this flying saucer and then saw these two very human looking men sort of coming out from the saucer, like speaking English. And again, this same situation occurred near Landican Lane, this apparent hotspot of time slip activity. So what's potentially fascinating about this story, particularly the first one in terms of like having this symbol with the Republic of Britain, it does point towards that maybe the monarchy is disbanded or got rid of and that now we're a republic and now kind of humanity has access to advanced propulsion vehicles which are able to time travel potentially. The sheer amount of Tom Sleeman's stories, particularly to do with time slips, it does make me a little bit suspicious because there are so many of them. Um, but even just during the course of research in this topic, actually, what I've noticed, if you go on a lot of these stories, could be national newspapers, could be the Daily Mail, or I think there's some in America that also reported on this, and then people in the comments are actually sharing their own experiences of having time slip. So maybe this is, is more common than we realise and just people keep quiet because they're embarrassed to share. So moving on from Tom Sleeman's work, I'm now going to focus on a book called An Adventure. Now this was released in 1911 and so the whole phrase and the whole definition of time slip didn't, I wasn't really defined back then. But what makes this story really fascinating and really quite highly credible is the people involved. They were two academics and they were visiting the Palace of Versailles, which is outside of Paris, about 11 miles outside of Paris. This is one of the original royal residencies for the royal family when they existed in France. But when these two academics visited the Palace of Versailles, the 10th of August 1901, and they had an incredibly epic, very, very intense time slip experience. And for me, it feels like one of the first recorded incidents of time slips in terms of when it's actually been written down as an account. And in fact, they created a whole book surrounding the entire experience itself. Now, these two academics weren't from any university. They were from Oxford. And what happened, they had this experience in France. And when they returned, one of them also had a similar experience in St. Margaret's Road, which is in Oxford itself. There are a lot of articles and blogs concerning this particular story. It's a well-known one. And the one I've decided to kind of read out here is from Dark Oxfordshire. And the title of the article is called uh, A Time Slip in St. Margaret's Road. And it was penned in the 15th of April, 2001. I'm just going to read some extracts from this article itself. Again, I'll leave this in the description notes for you to find yourself. When the book and adventure was published in 1911, it caused a sensation. It purported to be the true account of how two English women touring the grounds of the Palace of Versailles had either travelled through time or perhaps witnessed a very vivid haunting. They claimed to have found themselves walking through scenes from the palace's past, including seeing the ghost of Marie Antoinette and experiencing the gardens as they would have been in the 1700s. The book originally was published anonymously and it was not until after their deaths in 1931 that the identities of the two authors were made public. They were Charlotte Anne Moberly and Enola Jourdain of Oxford. The pair were senior staff members at St Hugh's College, both having held the role of principal of the college at different times. Their claims were much derided at the time, and since then there have been numerous theories put forward to explain what they claim to have seen, ranging from hallucinations to having stumbled into a fancy dress party. Nevertheless, the story captured the public's imagination. Both Mobley and Jourdain claim to have had other similar supernatural experiences both before and after their experience at Versailles. Most notably, Enola Jourdain claimed to have an experience a similar type of time slip in the road outside St Hugh's College in St Margaret's Road, Oxford. She described having seen a prisoner dressed in the style of the Middle Ages being dragged down the road, which was lined by jeering crowds wearing clothing of a similar period. I think this story is absolutely fascinating and, you know, it's even more credible due to the fact you have these two Oxford academics, you know, so they have a lot of social standing and they're kind of coming up with this quite fantastical information. Apparently, eventually, Mobley eventually distanced herself from these experiences, but Jourdain was very different. The other academics, she fully embraced it and continued to have, you know, mystical time altering experiences. But the conversation around time slips and, you know, where and how do these occur? You know, is it to do with a really complex interaction of geology 
earth energies and sort of cosmic solar energies or is it people having reincarnation flashbacks you know maybe they're having past lives and they're just having this really all-encompassing remembrance and i think maybe in this case my own theory with these women is that they when they traveled to france to versailles these were places they'd already been maybe they had reincarnated lives there and similar when they were back in oxford they were remembering periods of time when they spent in the middle ages might be quite interesting to read their book and adventure one day so i'll try and add that to my humongous reading list (laughs) which i'm slowly getting through Um, but yeah fantastic story Another quite credible and believable story involving time slips again occurred in the United Kingdom involving this individual called Sir Victor Goddard. And this is a quite a bizarre incident and it occurred in 1935, so obviously slightly before World War II. So Sir Victor Goddard was in the RAF, I guess, and he was flying over an abandoned airfield called Drem Airfield. And at that particular time in 1935, it was overgrown, it was unused. And then he flew back the same route a few days later and he seemed to encounter a very strange yellow cloud and it really disorientated Goddard's flight. Eventually, Sir Victor managed to break through the clouds and he said he saw Drem Airfield again. But this time it looked very, very different. It was completely operational. There were mechanics working on planes. The planes were painted bright yellow. The mechanics were wearing these blue overalls. And he also saw a very unfamiliar familiar, uh, monoplane, which was spotted on the runway. So I guess at that point in time when he was flying his plane, it was a biplane, so it had the two wings. So he was seeing a craft potentially from a future timeline. So Victor was completely disorientated. And by that point, the storm had actually returned and the airfield completely vanished from view again suddenly. Uh, Goddard eventually regained control of his plane. So I think he lost control of it slightly during the storm itself and was able then to land safely. Apparently he recounted this whole story, this whole situation in a book in 1975. And what he said when he returned to base, he told the story what he he witnessed to his colleagues, to his friends, and it was met with a huge amount of scepticism. But what happened a few years later, the RAF then started to paint their training planes yellow. And the monoplane he saw, the Magister, was introduced in 1939. Also, the mechanics, their uniforms changed and they were actually given blue overalls. And so the whole Drem airfield, which was originally disused in 1935, by 1939, it was completely operational again. Similar to the two academics who went to Versailles, this particular story, I think Sir Victor Goddard's time slip adventure is very well known. Um, I think it was very much popularised because it appeared in a magazine called Fate Magazine in the United States, which I think was quite a famous paranormal magazine at the time. I'm not sure if it's still running at the moment, but I guess this story is quite different to many others because he's you know, foretelling the future is going into this strange yellow cloud and then just suddenly popping into a different reality, a different time, you know, 1939, so a few years ahead and then returning back to his own time. And yeah, really, really fascinating one. Again, I guess, you know, is this scenario this experience personal to him you know would necessarily a different individual in a different plane that same exact time had a similar experience you know is victor goddard basically visualizing an experience he has in the future in some way or is it a atmospheric thing you know you're having this flux in the space time where future is is bleeding into the present in some way But again, what makes this credible is who he is. He obviously has a certain amount of social standing. He's a sir. He's been knighted. He's talking about this story. And he's he's very bold. He knows his own mind. He knows what he's experienced. And he's very confident what he's saying. And he has a lot to lose telling this story as well. So again, this makes this story even more fascinating. But as you continue to learn more and more about various time slip stories, you can start to then to categorize how these things are occurring. Are people seeing ghosts? Are they having a past life remembrance when visiting a particular location? Is it some kind of strange natural natural portal that's always there? Or is this just a kind of freak, again, bleeding of space time into another reality? This whole theory and situation to do with time slips has been picked up by quite major news organisations around the world, some in America. I'm going to reference now the Daily Mail. Obviously now is quite popular all over the world, has quite a big global reach. And they had an article called, Have You Ever Experienced a Time Slip? And this was written on the 16th of May, 2021. 
And it was just a general article discussing the time slip and talked about some of the more famous stories, you know, particularly ones we've just spoken about. But it basically brings up the story of a particular individual, which I will I'll read an extract from it now. Some paranormal investigators speculate that time slips tend to happen in more ancient areas where intense events have occurred. In 2011, relationships counsellor Rianne Kivitz, 46, visited the Temple of Karnak in Luxor. Because of social unrest in Egypt, the temples were totally empty, she remembers. She made her way to the goddess statue she wanted to see, when suddenly she felt disorientated. Somehow, the statue looked shiny and new, and I heard a noise, like a crowd shouting outside. I recall my partner speaking to me, but his voice was muffled. In the UK, many anecdotes of time slips emerge from historic counties of Devon, Cornwall and Kent, something that Rianne can attest to. At Compton Castle in Devon, she remembers seeing a knight in armour walking past her. It was as clear and real as everyday life, while at Leeds Castle in Kent, Alice Pollock reported a room suddenly changed in appearance and she saw a tall woman in white pacing. She later discovered that Queen Joan of Navarre had been accused of witchcraft and imprisoned there in the 15th century. These two ladies detailed in this Daily Mail article, it's quite a similar scenario and story as the academics who went to Versailles. Um, obviously quite tuned in sort of psychic women who are having these experiences. And again, I would ask the question of these past lives, or again, potentially, you know, maybe there is some sort of natural portal that's opened up where these times are kind of bleeding into their reality. This article really highlights how these sort of time slip scenarios are happening now in the present day still and probably will in the future. And the fact that, um, you know, this global behemoth news news organisation is now reporting, I find quite fascinating. There are a couple of books actually written on this particular subject of time slips, so they really specialise on this particular subject. And one author is called Rodney Davies, and his book is called Time Slips, Journey into the Past and the Future. At the beginning of this recording, I was discussing how, you know, how we know about these time slips because people having these experiences, maybe they're completely immersed in it, or maybe they just get a kind of flicker of it. Um, but they, you know, they're returning back to the present time to kind of tell their story and, and describe what they saw. But apparently he argues in this book that maybe thousands of people disappear every year due to these time slips. And he kind of harks back to how you find sort of strange machinery found in old coal seams so you, when they have these mines and then they're digging for coal and they find actual kind of machinery embedded in the coal. I have no idea geology wise how long it takes for coal to be produced, but I, I guess it's a very long time. So the fact that people are finding potential machinery or technology in these coal seams is, is quite strange. Um, but I wouldn't rule out the fact that maybe there are kind of have been civilizations, ancient civilizations that had these technologies. And obviously that doesn't really fit into the mainstream timeline of how humanity have developed. But again, yeah, maybe I could be wrong, but I guess from Rodney's point of view, he thinks that maybe the fact that they're people are finding these machinery in the ground, this kind of relates to the time slip phenomenon. What I can gather from the synopsis of the book is that I think he talks about how it's that whole adage in terms of like time happening all at once, you know, the past, the present, the future, we're all happening simultaneously. And somehow human consciousness can only really tune into the present time. But maybe they have freak situations where the consciousness shifts into the past or to the present and then starts to kind of view those timelines. I would say that's a very reasonable kind of summation and potentiality of like maybe what's happening with, this, with these scenarios. But I think moving on to one of the most famous locations for time slips, and again, you will find research to do with this street everywhere. This is again in Liverpool, Bold Street. You find many YouTube videos talking about this, blogs, articles, and again, it seems to be reported globally, so it's not just in the United Kingdom. I think what makes this story of note and quite important is the fact that you have multiple people having similar experiences. And yeah, of course, I think maybe because it gains popularity, there could be some stories in there where people have just like mischievously made it up. Um, but I think there's probably a lot of truth in some of the stories that are coming out from this particular street. Uh, and then let's not forget, you know, Liverpool is a very ancient place. I guess it would, it's, its heyday, I assume, would be in the Industrial Revolution, very much a big port. 
connected to world trade, it connected the north of England, especially to, to the world. And because it was such an important place in terms of being a port and connecting to the rest of the world, it very much influenced why it became such a haven for kind of music, you know, in terms of the Beatles, because you had all these imports from these records, particularly come from the United States, you know, from soul music and blues music, which I'd never really heard on these shores before. And it really kind of kicked off a, a complete musical revolution, sort of beginning in the late fifties and then roll, you know, really ramping up in the, in the sixties and the whole kind of Mersey beat and the British invasion in the United States was a humongous mon monolithic musical movement. Strangely, now Liverpool is deemed as being actually underpopulated due to the fact you have vast ways of, of parts of the city, streets just completely abandoned, large, beautiful old buildings completely abandoned, and because of the loss of the port, because of the loss of the warehouses. But anyway, that's a brief history of Liverpool. So reasonably centred to the city of Liverpool, there is Bold Street, and this is the place where people are experiencing these time slips. Multiple people have talked about their experiences being immersed in these past decades. And there seems to be a common thread of people being projected back to the 1950s and the 1960s. There are many questions about some of these stories. Some people perceive them as being hoaxes or hallucinations. But I think one of the most famous stories to come out of Bold Street involved an off-duty policeman called Frank. And this happened in 1996. And again, this kind of brings real credibility to the story because he's perceived as being an authority figure. So he's got a lot to lose telling this story. And also later on, I'm going to be discussing how the BBC did a slight documentary and picked up on this story as well later on. There are many, many articles and, and blogs written about this particular story. There's one I found on medium.com and it's called The Liverpool Time Slips and Mysterious Occurrences in Bold Street. And this is released on the 13th of February, 2018. I'm going to read an extract for you now. It is 1996. His wife decided she wanted to go and buy a book at Waterstones, the large bookstore. And they started to walk towards the area of the shop. As they approached Bold Street, Frank decides to go into another shop first and bumped into his friend and stopped to chat in the street. His wife went ahead without him. A few moments later, Frank said goodbye visited his shop and turned to go back to meet his wife. After reaching Bold Street, he headed on towards the bookstore. As he approached, he glanced up and was surprised to see the name, Crisps, above the door. As he was about to cross over to see what was going on, a van swept past him with the name Cardins on the side. The van's driver honked his old-fashioned horn and drove past. Looking around, Frank suddenly realised that things were not quite as they should be. He looked at the cars driving past and realised that they were old-fashioned vehicles such as people would drive back in the 1950s and 60s. And then he noticed the people. Men were wearing hats and mats and women were dressed in headscarves, full skirts and had old-fashioned hairstyles such as women wore after the war. By this time, Frank was beginning to feel slightly freaked out. He carried on crossing the road and headed towards the store. As he got closer, he noticed in the window there were handbags, shoes and umbrellas. Suddenly, he saw a young woman looking at the top of the shop sign. She looked confused. She was wearing modern clothes, and as she saw him approaching, she smiled at him. Frank went into the shop, closely followed by the young woman. When they entered, he was surprised and pleased to see it had indeed turned back into a bookshop. The young woman smiled, shook her head and said, That was strange. I thought it was a new clothes shop. And then she walked away, looking extremely puzzled. This may sound like an unlikely tale, but the odd thing about it, Frank was in fact a former police officer and was used to dealing in facts and definitely wasn't the type of person who would believe in the paranormal. Frank never stopped talking about it. Was this a time slip? Evidently, Crisps was a woman's shop that sold clothes and other goods decades before. And Cardins was also a well-known Liverpool firm that owned vans around the same time. So again, this is probably one of the most famous time slip stories that you see repeated everywhere. Um, but actually what's fascinating about this one is that actually people went back to try and find the individuals involved and try and confirm some of the details. Now, this was reported in the Birmingham Mail, which is another local news site, and they were talking about time slips, particularly within Bold Street. And they were reporting on the BBC who created a documentary series that I've never seen before called Uncanny. 
and it's presented by a guy called Danny Roberts. And I think they seem to, every single documentary, they focus on a different paranormal story. So I just realised I got that guy's name wrong. It's Danny Robbins is the presenter of this particular documentary series. Anyway, but they during this episode when they were concentrating on time slips, they went back to try and prove the policeman's story. They're trying to find that original policeman. They didn't manage to find him, but they actually found the girl in the story who also experienced that time slip. So the Birmingham Mail wrote an article concerning this, and it's called Woman's Horror as Time Slip Changes Everything on English Street, and she's suddenly in the 1940s. Now, this article was released quite recently. It's 27th of October in 2023. And again, I'll just read an extract of that now to you. Danny Robbins, who hosts Uncanny, asks if the story is true, to which Kieran says, I'd love it to be true. I think, I think it might be an urban myth, but you know, I just don't know. However, a little later in the episode, Danny is able to track down a woman called Julie, who claims she was the young lady caught up in the time slip. Danny also, he explains, he wasn't able to track down Frank. Danny explains, in 1996, Julie was in her 20s and had never experienced anything she thought was paranormal. The episode sees Danny meet Julie on Bold Street in Liverpool. Looking into the shop window, Julie says, So I stood here and I looked into the window and the display was old-fashioned, like 1940s vintage shoes and handbags. They looked really good quality and I thought, oh wow. I didn't know whether they were just vintage or they just put on an old fashioned 40s theme. And then I turn and I seen the people. I'd seen probably about 12 people and they were like in 1940s, 1950s clothes. The men stuck in my mind more. It's that they had Macs and hats on. And I distinctly remember a man with a big paper under his arm. Asked by Danny if she went into the shop, Julie says, Yeah, I went into the shop. I opened the door and. As I went in, initially, everything was old-fashioned displays. It was dark inside. And then, as I turned around, the shop became lighter again. Next to me, there were just book displays, and I'd seen a sign for Dylan's. As I'm coming out of the door, a man in 90s clothes, now this is the first person I'd seen in the normal 90s clothes, grabbed my arm and he said, did you see that? And I was like, yeah. Danny asked if the man was Frank, to which Julie replied, yeah. All I could think of was to get out of here as quick as I can. I was really scared because part of me thought, what if I don't come back? What if I go out this door and those people are still, it's still old, still old, past in time. So these further investigations into this story just make this really compelling because it's again involved the policeman, admitted that they couldn't find him, and but they managed to find this lady, Julie, who apparently is part of this story. And it just goes to show how much this is really being cemented in the public consciousness even more. The fact that this was you know, projected on national television on the United Kingdom. So it really adds a lot of weight to this story. So moving on to a bit more of a silly one, a bit more of a mad one. This is a, a story involving a man who has a time slip slip experience and he's able to bring back new Beatles material. He somehow managed to fall into a completely different parallel universe where the Beatles never broke up and they continue to tour and they continue to make music. Now there's an entire website surrounding this whole event and it's called BeatlesNeverBrokeUp.com um, It looks like it was launched on the 9th of September 2009 and noticeably it seemed to, when it was launching, to uh, marry up with a Beatles anniversary campaign that was occurring at the same time as well. Whether the two things are linked officially, I have no idea. Um, anyway, but if you go to this website, uh, thebeatlesneverbrokeup.com, you can download the whole album for free. And also I found the track, someone's uploaded it on YouTube as well, so you can kind of find them there. But the whole story surrounds an individual called James Richard, and he's traveling to Del Puerto Canyon in California. And I guess it's quite a kind of, I don't know the area, I guess it's quite a desert region. And he stops his car and he has his dog with him and his dog manages to run away and so then he tries to chase after his dog to try and catch up and eventually um, he trips over a rabbit hole in the ground and then just knocks himself out. So James wakes up on the desert floor after knocking himself out and he's discovered by an individual called Jonas who lives nearby. So Jonas helps him, 
get up and then takes James back to his home so he can recover. Now, the first thing that's weird about where he's woken up is that before when he was running around looking for his dog, there was no properties to be seen, no hint of civilization, no people. So that was already a weird thing. This is where the story gets a little bit silly and this is where I'm like, okay, this is obviously not potentially true. Um, but he wakes up in this parallel universe but doesn't realise it at the time. But this new reality, their ketchup is not red, but it's purple. Plus, they never embraced, you know, CDs as a, a medium in terms of like listening to music. They still use cassettes so that, you know, the cassette was still king. Then the next difference to this reality, which is obviously linked to this Beatles aspect, is the fact that the Beatles never split up and they continue to make music. And then I guess that meant that John Lennon continued on and didn't die. And so he continued on into old age and they continued to create more and more music. Jonas then apparently went through his music collection, you know, showing repeated Beatles music tapes that didn't exist in his reality. These were completely new albums of music. Now, Jonas left the room at some point and then Richards decided to run out the house and try and get back to his own reality. Whilst he was doing that, he grabbed one of the cassette tapes with him as well. So he managed to get back to, you know, the present, the current reality, his own reality. But with him, he had this cassette of lost Beatles music from this other parallel dimension. Yes, I know this story is quite out there and a little bit stupid, but yeah, it's a bit of fun. And I do recommend actually going to the website thebeatlesneverbrokeup.com because you obviously can download the music then it's actually really really good it seems to be like a mashup of existing Beatles tracks they sort of combine them to make about I can't remember eight nine ten eleven new tracks out of existing music you were four guys that uh, I met Paul and said do you want to join the band and then George joined and then Ringo joined we were just a band who made it very very big I thought. But this individual, James Richards, stays true to the story. He sort of denies this is a mashup album. And if you go on the website, they have, they provide evidence, photos of the tapes and the location where this all happens. So, yeah, maybe there's like a 1% chance that this story is true. I, I doubt it, though. Um, but yeah, because it is quite silly. But these new tracks, actually, it really reminds me as a whole album uh, produced by Cirque du Soleil. I think that's how you pronounce it. You know, they have those big sort of theatrical circus style events, I think in Las Vegas, where they have these amazing multi-million dollar purpose-built theatre. And I think they did a Beatles theme one uh, once, uh, like a show uh, with all these kind of theatrical performers. And anyway, but they had like a mashup CD where they sort of seamlessly merged all the various Be Beatles track into kind of one long mix. And it was really amazing. I, I remember buying it probably about 10, 15 years ago now. It's a fantastic album. It actually reminds me a little bit of that. So we're moving more now into the whole idea of time slip and the, the cultural kind of connections, you know, this Beatles story, although I don't believe this actually potentially happened. You know, I could be completely wrong. Um, but what's fascinating, like with a lot of this phenomenon, like I've spoken previously before in this podcast, in terms of the Renaissance Forest event, you have all these big sci-fi films that are being released around that particular time, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, like Star Wars is kind of coming out. And like how potentially these films maybe influence kind of what's going on is that affecting the collective consciousness of humanity and we're now sort of manifesting these events in some particular way. And I started to look at time slip potentially in the same way because I stumbled across, apparently this is way before my time, but there's a whole children's series in the United Kingdom called Time Slip, and it actually aired uh, 1970 to 1971. It involved two teenagers who discovered basically a time barrier, and they're able to go into this time barrier and have basically travel into time, whether it be future or the past, and have all these adventures. Uh, and this was on ITV, which is kind of the commercialized version of the BBC in the UK. So they have adverts, whereas obviously the BBC. Is publicly funded so they don't have advertising when you you watch the programs so it feels to me that maybe this children's program because it was really popular at the time and i think it became a real cult classic and it wasn't until i researched the whole 
thing of like time slips. I stumbled across this whole TV show. Um, but it feels like maybe this show, you know, and the actual word time slip redefined, you know, the whole phenomenon in some way. If you watch kind of clips of it now, it looks a little bit shonky in terms of the effects and things. And, you know, it is quite haunting, but I will play a clip for you now. Again, this time barrier allows them to travel time. They travel to different areas in history, both in the past and the future, and they experience and have many different adventures. I think during the course of the show, when they time travel, they're experiencing there are many stories surrounding apparently to do with cloning, which is interesting, environmental issues and other alternate timelines. And again, it became like a real, real cult classic. So it just feels that this 1970s children's TV show potentially redefined the idea of time slips. And, you know, again, the, the really famous example of these time slips in Bold Street in Liverpool, this wasn't happening until, you know, the mid early 90s. And again, like with Sir Victor and his plane and the two academics when they travelled to Versailles, there's lots of examples that happened of time slips way before the 1970s. It feels like that this TV show potentially defined, you know, gave it a name. I was using, you know, chat GPT to sort of try and track down other examples of time slips in cultural, you know, work, whether it be books or films. And it highlighted an example of Mark Twain's K Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, which was a book written in 1898. And it's a satirical novel of a modern man for its time. And he, he falls into a time slip and finds himself in medieval period during King Arthur. Now, this is very synchronistous, very fortuitous, because I've been doing so much research and I'm still currently reading a book at the moment by Catherine Maltwood, all about the Arthurian legends and things. And the fact that, you know, I found a threaded connection between time slips and King Arthur is quite wild. Obviously, this is a complete fictionalized story, but yeah, it's still a powerful connection for me. But overall, that idea of suddenly finding yourself in from the present time where you are into a past or future timeline is quite a well-used plot device within story, whether that be within literature or films. It's a very well-used plot device and makes for a very exciting story. But carrying on with this cultural idea of time slips and then being used in story, whether that be literature or film or TV, but then also when I was previously talking about what's the mechanism of time slips, how does it work? Is it something to do with ghosts? Is it something to do with past lives? Is it something to do with earth energies? Is it something to do with the atmosphere? Like all these things, you know, what is actually happening? And there's a very interesting um, show, again, which I wasn't aware of before, called The Stone Tape Theory. Strangely, this is another drama produced by this BBC around about the same time. This is 1972. But this is not really for children. This is kind of aimed at adults because it is described as a horror drama. But I'm going to read you an extract from Wikipedia that explains some of the plot. The stone tape theory is a pseudo scientific claim that ghosts and hauntings occur when historical information is released from rocks and other items. The idea of materials holding information from emotional or traumatic events aligns with the views of the 19th century intellectualists and psychic researchers such as Charles Babbage, Eleanor Stidwich, and Edmund Gurney. <laughs> Crazy names. Anyway, I continue. Contemporarily, the concept was popularised by the 1972 Christmas ghost story called The Stone Tape, produced by the BBC. Following the play's popularity, the idea and turn stone tape were retrospectively and inaccurately attributed to the British archaeologist turned parapsychologist T.C. Lathbridge who believed that ghosts were not spirits of the deceased, but were simply non-interactive recordings, similar to a movie. 
This is a very interesting idea. I'm going to play a clip from that show for you now. your code number you fed it in i didn't you must have done it. there are words well, there might be words see pray so that's so there pray prayer it's in the computer no it is it is bloody it's fool it's you picked up words you got words you saw that's how it works i told you then it is Again, this is the first time I'm learning about this show. Um, so it's all completely new to me, um, but really fascinating how it all kind of potentially like ties into this whole time slip narrative. Um, but the whole idea is of this show, apparently the plot, the general gist of it, is that you have a whole load of audio recording scientists and they go into this old Victorian building because they're trying to discover a new recording medium. Now, this building hasn't been properly renovated yet and they end up in this room it's still basically all stone. So it's very, very cold room. It has stone all around it. So this very cold, stark room where the scientists are there, they have all their recording equipment there. They suddenly encounter this shrill, this woman screaming and her running away. And they become convinced actually one of the stones has actually recorded this uh, emotional event from the past in some way. Although terrified, they become very fascinated and excited by they've actually discovered a new way of recording, a new way of audio recording, you know, through these stones in some way. So they try to locate this particular stone in this room that's actually recorded this event, you know, hence why the whole show is called Stone Tape. I think there's lots of other details that I'm sort of missing out, but overall they figure out, I think, somehow that the stone, how the stone works, it interacts with the human's nervous system which enables them to sort of tune into these emotional high impact events that these stones have recorded. But I think this stone tape, you know, series, this TV show, I think it was only one show actually. Um, you know, again, it's just fascinating how potentially this cultural event, this cultural story may have also influenced the wider world, you know, the world that we inhabit in some way. I think now I should wrap and conclude things and wrap it up in a summary. So a few things, I think in terms of like, you know, where you live in your local area, I think it's always quite good fun to try and find those hidden stories, those, those hidden phenomena that's lying around the landscape in some way. I mean, these time slip stories make for really good local news. And that's how I stumbled across it through this Wirral Globe website, because it was relatively close by. Um, but then I just discovered it actually was a, a more well-known uh, locations in terms of Bold Street in Liverpool where, you know, it's been widely reported across the world. And obviously the BBC have investigated as well and actually found some quite credible, credible evidence. You've uncovered this woman, Julie, who was involved in the story. And then, you know, there's the book, The Adventure, which is very, very um, powerful story because it involved these two Oxford academics. So they had a lot to lose in their career wise and, and personally in talking about this, you know, this experience that they had in Versailles. And obviously the Sir Victor story when he was in his plane, when he saw the future, this is another really, really good, credible story because of who he was and the fact he was this authority figure. I think with time slips, there's multiple reasons why people are having these experiences. And again, it could be due to ghosts. It could be sort of discarnate spirits that people are interacting with. Definitely something to do with past life remembrance. When you go into a particular area you've been to before in a parallel life, you just suddenly get this remembrance I think that something's occurring as well. But also I think the idea of the magnetic field, I'm a big sort of advocate for the idea when the magnetic field is 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 destabilized in some way that you're having other realities bleed into this one. And particularly the idea, you know, really emotional, quite violent, high impact events. And the idea of that TV show, show Stone Tape, maybe there is something in the fact that the geology, the stone can somehow record these events in some way. And these are thoughts and ideas and concepts I have, you know, considered previously because in quartz stone, it is well known that you can actually store information in there. So I think if that, you know, these uh, stones are then interacting with earth energies or cosmic energies, maybe there is some way that these stones are recording these emotional visual events in some way and replaying it at certain times. I think on other podcasts, when I've been more uh, descriptive on earth energies, there's a whole 
situation around underground water as well. I think more feminine water where there's a lot of activity in terms of people seeing apparitions and other visualizations, which is due to underground water. I'm not quite sure the scientific interaction, why it's occurring, but there's definitely a connection between underground water and people seeing events as well. But in terms of like the BBC, I kind of rarely watch, I guess, British television anymore. I'm really kind of locked into a lot of the streaming services, you know, like Amazon Prime and Apple TV and things. Um, and I've really dropped out from kind of watching what we call like terrestrial television programmes. But I don't think the BBC are really churning out original content like that anymore. I mean, you get things like Doctor Who. I think that's their big set set piece that they have but obviously that's now in collaboration with disney i think i've never really been a big fan of the new modern doctor who's i used to watch the doctor who's back in the 80s and 90s when i was a kid but i've never really watched the kind of modern one but that stone tape program and then also the time slip children's tv show just reminds me actually how creative some of the original british tv could be and you know i grew up in the 80s and 90s and I have these really quite haunting memories of some of the shows that they would have for kids on television. Um, they're amazing, but they're all slightly scary. And I think it's the sort of content you probably wouldn't get now. Um, but, you know, sometimes when I listen to the theme tunes and I've looked for them on YouTube, it just sends shiver down my spine because they were so good. And the kind of these shows are really etched in my consciousness. I think it's quite profound, especially when I've been talking about time slips, because a lot of these shows involved some kind of time slip mechanism or then you know these children falling to other realities i mean i'm talking about live action tv so i'm not like cartoons these are proper sort of dramas and there's one called moon dial we'll play a clip for you now of the theme tune maybe it will send shivers down your spine if you were you know around in that era Moondial was a really good one and I think it was this girl was able to move into two, two different timelines and interact with these two children in these different periods of time. Um, yeah, really fantastic. And there was another one called The Children of Green No. I'll play that for you now. And the final one, Box of Delights, really haunting. I guess if you weren't in the UK that particular time as a child, this would be, you know, probably means nothing to you. Um, but there's a certain particular feeling when I hear those theme tunes again, it just sort of sends shivers by, down my spine. So if you kind of around in that period of time, you may have the same experience as me. But there does seem to be a general theme through some of these podcasts that I'm doing when I'm looking at these various kind of paranormal events or areas of high strangeness, the kind of the cultural context with it as well. You know, like I mentioned with Post encounters the third time and the whole Renishim thing, and uh, you know, in Todd Maud and etc. And it feels like time slip is a similar thing, you know, there's all these children's TV shows sort of starting early 70s, going through all the 80s, where they're involving sort of children falling into time slips and going into the past or the present, or sorry, into the future, etc. So, how much are the writers of these shows potentially channeling these ideas and then obviously? presenting them to the collective consciousness or in some way these stories that are then written are then potentially affecting the collective consciousness in the United Kingdom. This is why you then suddenly get such a high level of time steps occurring in this country. 
this is what I've just found from my cursory research. I could be completely off the mark, but it does feel that it's quite a hotbed of activity in the UK for time slips. But it just feels story and narrative is so important for people, for humanity, for the collective consciousness. And again, this has been made even more real with my latest video, which you should watch, obviously, the vlog when I went to Glastonbury. And it all became about King Arthur. And it's just so many stories and they all intermingle King Arthur with kind of Jesus and also Celtic mythology. So there's, there's a very kind of deep set allegories that are kind of deeply within our consciousness that we're not really aware of. And yeah, I just find that whole scenario. I'm not even really a literature guy at all, but I've just really uncovered, I guess, this last year, two years of how important story is to us. I've always had like a regular daydream, actually, you know, what would happen if I went into a time slip and found myself in a completely different time? I'd probably have a similar action to Julie in Liverpool, where I'd be a little bit freaked out. It's like, could I get back? You know, I would have a slight panic attack. I think I don't think I'd be like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And because you'd be really concerned, I would be concerned I'd get stuck in that time. And then, you know, <laughs> what would you do if you were stuck in this time? Because, you know, I'm useless in any other era because all my skills surround computers so if computers don't exist then i'm pretty rubbish <laughs> if that author rodney davies is correct about time slips and he proposes the fact that potentially thousands of people go missing in time slips all the time i would hope it happened to me you know touch wood it doesn't that i had like an iphone on me that so at least i could potentially prove to people that i came from a different era Anyways, this has been a fun podcast, um, particularly, you know, when I was talking about the television series, actually, it's really piqued my interest and given me a little bit of inspiration, maybe for some deeper research in another podcast at some point. Um, particularly, there's a one show that sticks in my mind, which is called Alternative 3, uh, which is based on a book and then was, I think, was dramatised again by British TV, probably the BBC, I think during the 70s. But a lot of researchers, particularly within ufology, perceive this uh, piece of work to be a type of soft disclosure because it talks about the secretiveness of having human bases on Mars and things. And um, yeah, so a lot of people point towards Alternative 3 being a type of soft, soft disclosure in some way. I think that's a bigger conversation, you know, particularly some of these shows I talked about now, like how much of that is not just purely just story that is strategically put there as a form of disclosure in a way in in a way to you know try and affect the collective consciousness and i think also there's another conversation to be had about some of these big british institutions some of them have now been privatized and kind of broken up but you have these bbc obviously it's to do with television and radio and um, british telecom was originally kind of the publicly owned telephone service so back in the 80s you had a telephone it was through british telecom now it's all privatized and you get individual companies now. BT's still around, but it's now private. Um, and so, yeah, again, the BT Telecom, that all kind of feeds into the, the Rendlesham narrative, particularly of Orford Ness and around that whole Suffolk area. You get places like Marconi, which is now a defunct sort of software development agency. And that ties into ideas to do with like Falklands War and this discovery of this sentient black goo and the ideas of alien AI. And, and I think like all of the, the BBC and the BT and the Marconis and even the NHS, actually, sometimes I think there's a deeper reason for their existence, you know, particularly the NHS, more of a, a medical surveillance sort of institution. You know, there's no doubt in certain cases they help you. Um, but some of these institutions, I think there are darker reasons for them existing. And I think maybe at some point I should kind of research more into those areas. Now, I think because everything's being so centralised, you know, a lot of our TV, I mean, I'm guilty of this because I'm watching Apple TV, I'm watching Prime, you know, that's kind of what the powers that be, that's what they want. They want everyone to be watching the same centralised source of information. And I think, you know, particularly with some of the covert research, maybe through what was happening with British Telecom, Marconi obviously doesn't exist anymore. I think these are all being absorbed by, you know, this strange deep state military industrial complex which is quite dominant you know coming from america from the us so a lot of this stuff is being centralized really but yes i think that's a story for another time another podcast but yeah thank you so much for joining me this has been fun as usual uh please do donate for feeling fruity you can catch me on youtube on rumble on bitshoot you can check me on all you know major kind of podcasting platforms i think on there 
My website is reconsidersimon.com and I will catch you later. Have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.